Uh, thank you very much for attending. This is Pragmatic AI for in-house lawyers. Um, I'm going to be your host today. I'm Brendan Raybuck. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at ClearLaw. Um, just a quick note, everybody, uh, Kathy just asked if people can start introducing themselves within the chat. Please feel free to do. We've got, I think, a great group of people, and there's going to be some great opportunities to network with people. Um, as well, if there are any questions as we go along, please feel free to drop them into the chat. We may be able to ask some of our panelists some of your questions um, as we go forward. Um, so again, I'm Brendan Raybuck. I'm Chief Revenue Officer at ClearOS. I'll be moderating today. Uh, we have a really great group of panelists today. Uh, love for them to quickly introduce themselves. So Kathy, would you love to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I'm the CEO and um, co-founder, also GC of Streamline AI. We're an intelligent intake, triage, and workflow automation tool for in-house legal. And I actually spent the last decade uh, practicing law. Uh, most recently, I was the AGC at DoorDash, where I built the commercial legal team from the ground up to support growth from 1,000 to over 10,000 employees. And the biggest pain point for me was always around legal intake, which is why I teamed up with a Google engineer and we built uh, Streamline. Excellent. Kevin, why don't you uh, go next? Yeah, I'm Kevin Keller. Uh, I'm an engineer turned attorney. I have been at most of the uh, the companies that you recognize, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and a few others. I'm currently legal at Adept AI, where we're creating general AI, um, which uh, some people have uh, some concerns about, but I'm sure you're trying to do it in a great way. So. And I can confirm that Kevin is indeed not a bot. Um, so, <laughs> um, Jordan, why don't you go introduce yourself? Cool. Thanks for uh, being here, everyone. My name is Jordan Rittenauer. I'm the CEO of ClearLaw. At ClearLaw, we are focused on turning contracts into actionable intelligence automatically. Uh, we think contracts are the foundation for almost every B2B relationship. And what's in a contract impacts the entire organization. So we want to make that contract language into data that can then be useful and disseminated throughout the organization. Um, before starting ClearLaw, I was uh, in the U.S. Army. I was an infantry officer and military intelligence officer for a few years, then went back to school, got my law degree. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so three attorneys and myself. So I feel like I'm lucky to be around smart people today. Um, why don't we start off some interesting questions? And I, I love to start by level setting. So Jordan, as, as you're the CEO of a, an AI company in legal, why don't you start off with some foundations? We hear a lot about a lot of different terms, AI, generative AI, machine learning, do you want us kind of quick overview of what all these terms kind of mean? Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll keep it broad and go into more specifics later on. But you can think of AI, artificial intelligence, as the overall group or the uh, practice of turning, uh, uh, enabling machines essentially to mimic human intelligence um, for problem solving, pattern recognition, understanding natural language. Um, then within artificial intelligence, I'm going to start with supervised machine learning or machine learning uh, more generally. But you can think of this as, as teaching a machine how to recognize certain things. So there's a, a really funny example of um, blueberry muffins versus chihuahuas. And they were trying to teach computer vision um, how to identify the difference between those two. So they were giving the machine a lot of examples of both blueberry muffins and saying, hey, this is a blueberry muffin, or giving it a lot of pictures of chihuahuas um, and saying, this is a chihuahua. And it was actually still really hard uh, for, it took some time to get that right. Because if you've seen that, that it's, I think it's a meme in a, a lot of places, they do look pretty similar. It can be hard for humans to detect that. But the idea is you teach it through a massive set of annotated labeled data uh, so it can get the right answer. Now, generative AI has gotten a lot of buzz, Gen, gen AI, um, really in the last 18 months since um, I guess GPT 3.5 came out and then later four. Um, but it's really been around for a long time. We've seen, you know, AI generated videos for a long time. They often have humans with 11 fingers or, you know, legs are in the wrong spot. So the technologies continue to get better. I think um, the focus on LLMs in the last 18 months, which are large language models, that's really been um, impressive. The difference for, for them is they're trained on so much more data, um, you know, billions of, of data points rather than millions billions of parameters, um, and they create new content. So they use what they've been taught before to generate a response that in theory is completely new. Now we've seen, I think OpenAI is currently being uh, sued uh, by the New York Times because 
sometimes it just generated the exact article text. Uh, so there's some issues there. Um, but I, I mentioned large language models. That's a subset of generative AI focused on natural language. You also have a, a lot of uh, image and video generation uh, tools that are, are getting better and better. And we'll go into the details on, on more of those in, here in a second. Yeah, I think I'd love to click a little bit on kind of things like ChatGPT. You know, I think I read somewhere that has 180 million users. Is it something that lawyers should just start start jumping in and using, or are there limitations or unknowns that they need to understand first? I guess it depends what, what you're using it for. So I know we both use um, ChatGPT, Claude, some other LLM models. We're not using them for legal work. Um, and that's where I, you've probably, I think Kathy's going to get into this later. There have been some issues with people, re attorneys relying on it to generate uh, a brief or submit something to the court. And um, the risk there is they are great at providing an answer. They will give you an answer and it will look real. It will look valid. But the question is, how do you know it's actually based in truth and fact? And that's one of the areas that, that we're working on is making these um, fact checkable, essentially. But they're not, for the most part, they're not trained on legal sources. Um, on, it's only on publicly available information. Um, and you can think of, this is actually not my, my thought. This is uh, an engineer at OpenAI, the creator of, of ChatGPT and GPT-4. He compares LLMs to dream machines. And I think that's really useful because, you know, you can be in a dream and, and even know you're in a dream, but you can't necessarily control where it goes. It might be a great dream. It might go sideways and turn into a nightmare. And we only think of hallucinations as a problem when we know that they're incorrect. But essentially, everything that LLMs are doing right now are hallucinations. Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Um, so personally, I use it for brainstorming, you know, creating a list of, hey, here's some, some things to think about. I've used it to write a, a draft of a, a letter to a uh, city council member that I wanted to get in touch with. Requires a lot of editing and fine tuning, but I think they're great right now to jump in and just get over that initial maybe writer's block and give you some ideas to get started. Kathy, I know you've been following a lot of the news around JI, generative AI really closely. What are some of the examples of it going wrong that you think you can share with the panel? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, first, before I do that, uh, before anyone thinks that we're really like raining on ChatGPT or Gen AI's parade, I want to stress it's a really remarkable technological advancement, right, for all of humanity. Uh, just like Jordan said, I mean, it really changes how we've always thought about machines because Gen AI can actually show creativity and it can learn and it can improve. And, you know, maybe some of you actually read a while back um, that a Gen AI system was actually able to beat the world's best player at a game called Go, which is thousands of years old, seen as like the oldest game, board game that exists, and also considered by many to be the most strategic and complex game. So being able to beat a human, I mean, I think that's pretty incredible. Uh, and it's possible eventually, right, for Gen AI to help us take leaps forward on global issues. Um, and that's why, you know, everyone's talking about it, because it is so incredible. But like Jordan said, it's also very much still developing. Um, and ChatGPT and most general purpose LLMs have not been trained on legal specific data, but it can create something that looks very, very good. And I think that is part of the danger, right? Because um, it can actually be completely wrong and fabricated. Um, and I just read a Bloomberg Law article last week about research that was done on 20,000 different use cases, so not a small sample size. And researchers identified that general purpose LLMs are hallucinating at least 75% of the time. That's worse than a coin toss when answering questions about a court's core ruling. So I think that really confirms our worst nightmares, right, as legal practitioners when we're thinking about using this in our work, um, because we could get a completely erroneous response more often than getting a right one. Um, and then another really famous example that was all over the news last year that many of the audience, I'm sure, also heard about um, is a personal injury lawsuit that was filed against Avianca Airlines. And the plaintiff in that suit alleged that he suffered harm when he was doing work for the airline. And his lawyer submitted a legal brief that cited to half a dozen court decisions. But it turns out no one could actually find these decisions or even the quotations that were cited in the brief uh, because they didn't exist. And the lawyer... You know, he actually admitted to using ChatGPT for research, but here's the rub. 
he actually asked ChatGPT if the cases were real and the system convinced, like actually said, yes, <laughs> all of this wow. is amazing <laughs> and it's completely accurate and you can absolutely trust me and you can use this. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm making that part of the dialogue up, but like it was actually verified by the system. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I think that case really just highlights um, the harm that could be done to a lawyer's career because now it's all over the news. You know, this poor person, I don't know who who's going to, you know, have him represent them anymore. And um, it really just underscores the importance, right, of, of human oversight and really critical evaluation when you're using Gen AI um, and, and not just directly passing something along, right, to the to the client or to a court. Uh, I think that's really insightful. I appreciate that, Kathy. Um, you know, I think we've been hearing a little bit about how AI has a lot of promise, but there there are still some challenges with it. Kevin, I'd love to pivot to you. You know, you're leading an in-house team today. How are you leveraging AI within your current job? How is your team leveraging it? And what are some of the advantages? What are some of the disadvantages or challenges you're having? And then I'd also love to talk a little bit about adoption. How are you getting people to actually use these tools? Is there confidence that you need to build? Is there a growth pattern you're looking at? We'd love to understand your perspective. Yeah, in my former role at Super, I mean, we started, um, I, I was using it pretty extensively. I think that um, there is a lot of hype. Um, this feels like, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, the internet and cyber everyone all of a sudden became a cyber attorney um you know i'm a cyber techno trademark attorney but really you're just applying your trademark to a new area and um and and that's i think what you're seeing now um with ai it's been around um it is uh it adds a new flavor to what we're doing but i see it really as advanced search um we've been using google in the practice of in-house law for a long time, doing a really quick search, finding a starting point a reference, a statute that we then go look up and dive into deeper if we need to. Um, the same is true with AI. It gives you maybe a more holistic, a, a better written output or summary of a statute, but you need to go back and look at it yourself and see, is that is that proper? Um, prompting is really important. So when I go and ask, you know, whether it's ChatGPT or Claude or another model, a question, I've got my setup in ChatGPT to be, hey, I'm an attorney and I've described a junior attorney and the features of that person and what I expect of them and how I expect them to review it, double review it, check the sites and all this. And so the output I'm getting from the, the model is a lot better than just generally asking a question without setting up prompts before. I know there's some attorneys, you know, Cecilia Zanini uh, is uh, got a prompting class, which is really good. She's got a company she started called Gen AI, which I think um, she's probably doing some customized prompting behind the scenes to get an output that's really great for that. I've been advising a company called Sage um, Council um, in doing some of this so that you can generate a great output but the key, as Kathy said, is having a human in the loop. And so for me at Super, I started implementing and worked with Sage AI on, on doing this, implementing a simple solution where somebody could ask a question in Slack. It triggered an AI assistant. That output went first to an attorney who could review it. And if they gave a thumbs up, it went back to the person. But if they didn't give a thumbs up, it sat there and waited for a review or some modification. So I think those are the kind of things that you need to do, just like you would never send your raw output of a Google search about a particular law or issue directly to the client. You wouldn't send the raw output of uh, an AI directly to a client either. So it sounds like you and as your team doing it, it helps you accelerate it, but you do need to spend time reviewing it, ensuring its accuracy. So it sort of help trust but validate sort of at the end validate. of the day it absolutely accelerates um josh kubiak um has a brainiac series and in his uh, course that he teaches has a really powerful thing he's like generating a slide deck that takes me hours to do by myself you give chat gpt a command and it spits out the code drop it into, into um, presentations and you have a presentation in five minutes. Um, that is a, is a game changer, you know, saves a lot of time that you can then focus on strategic things. 
So I see it as a real efficiency tool for attorneys. If you're not using it, you're probably wasting a lot of your time. I mean, if I can just jump in and add another thought, Kevin, because I, I think um, using exactly to your point, using it to just generate um, the starting point for you, ideas. I, I think Jordan mentioned this too, um, with with just giving you like the ability to to shortcut some of the brainstorming. So what I've done is, hey, I'm about to have a difficult conversation with a teammate. And I even want just some advice on how to approach that difficult conversation. I can actually ask, you know, ChatGPT, can you give me some suggestions and outlines on how to approach it? And it's even better if you can put it into like, you know, imagine if you are this kind of role and you're talking to that kind of a role about this specific issue, you know, or, or like coming up with ideas for team offsides. I mean, these are all silly, like, you know, little things, right? But we can spend a long time just trying to come up with, you know, different ideas on that. So another interesting use. I think, yeah, I'd love to expand up a little bit upon that, Kathy. I think, and I've, I've known you for uh, a few months now, so I've heard you talk about, you know, in kind of relation to what Kevin's talking about is understanding your prompts, getting comfortable with them. It's kind of a new skill set that attorneys are learning. And I know one of the reasons why you started Streamline was that you wanted to improve some of the tooling that in-house counsel have access to. So I'd love for you to talk about sort of how adoption and, and improving kind of the experience the technology is. And then also, right, talk a little bit about how we're incorporating together uh, clear laws AI into those systems to make that a streamless, a streamlined approach. Pardon yeah, the pun absolutely. there. Yes, definitely. So I'll take the first part of the question around adoption. And, you know, there's so many different legal tools in the market these days. And everything around AI, I know is very new for a lot of legal teams. I think what's really critical for providers like us is to really design systems um, that enable our customers to quickly and easily learn um, all of these new frameworks, new, these new technologies. I think usability is at the top of that list, right? Because if you come up with the best technology, but it's super difficult to implement, really hard to wrap your head around and use, then adoption obviously isn't gonna go very far. Um, so, you know, that's really why I co-founded Streamline with Julian, um, who's a former product lead at Google. We were super convinced that there was an opportunity in the market to improve tooling for legal users and really meet them and their business teams where they are. Um, so, you know, I, I think, look at our workflow automation, for example, it's, it's no code. Um, and I think a lot of other providers, when they say no code, they actually mean low code, or they mean, you know, you need to, to like learn light JavaScript to know how to actually make it work. For us, we designed it for the way that lawyers think. So it's structured in an if-then format, and lawyers can get their hands on that and actually really build their own um, automation, you, you know, using that part of the functionality. So my, my, my viewpoint also of legal technology is that you do need founders who have a legal background because if you're on the outside peering in and you're doing user research, and even if you talk to 50 lawyers, you never truly understand, right, what the day-to-day -day work entails. Um, so that's why, you know, you find founders like Jordan and Kevin, I know you're uh, advising Sage. I mean, we're coming at it from having lived a day in the life, right? Like many, many, many days. And, and so... Uh, the systems that we design are truly catered to the way that legal teams work, um, and it addresses a lot of the risks because we've, you know, built that into the design. And so, um, answering the second part of your question, Brendan, around how um, Streamline and ClearLaw are partnering together. So, um, let me first set some context here. In-house lawyers, um, as the audience knows. Right? We often deal with a very high volume of contracts, sales contracts, vendor contracts, partnerships, marketing. Um, often that's the largest volume of legal requests that we get in the door. And what I've personally experienced and also heard from other lawyers is that the biggest bottleneck to contracting processes has always been the workflow around it, not necessarily just the redlining or the clause management, right? Like when I, I was um, a contracts lawyer at Medallia before I joined DoorDash, and I remember how long it took me just to do an initial triage of that first, like first turn of the red line, and then route certain terms that deviated from our standard playbooks to other teams for approval. So for example, if I get a really weird infosec term, I need to loop in a member of the infosec team, right? To like look look at it, opine on it, um, or maybe something that created issues for revenue recognition, I had to pass that to, to finance. Um, and if I had a huge backlog of contracts, then it would probably take me days or maybe even a week to actually triage everything and then just get it out the door for approval. And all of a sudden I'm one week behind, right? Even starting the approval process. 
So that's what we're doing with Clear Law is we're trying to automate that um, and 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 have it take minutes instead of you know half an hour for you to actually triage and go through an agreement because that's what the AI does is it parses through the whole contract it gives you a red or a green um, if it matches your playbook you know it's a green if it doesn't and it deviates it gives you a you know a red um, kind of stoplight you know this 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 needs further review. And then, like I said, we have workflow automation. So you build out who you want the deviations to route to, who you want to flag, right, and signal. So all of a sudden, in like 10 minutes, you've gone through your whole backlog, triage that sent things out for approval. Think about how much faster your contracting will go, right? Um, and so we're super, super excited about, about this partnership and what we're building together. I think that's really exciting. And I think you hit on something that I, something we talk a lot about here at Clear Law, which is like contracts, obviously they're negotiated by, by lawyers, but at the same time, a lot of that data isn't, isn't always legal specific. It is things like, and you mentioned payment terms or having to route things to finance, right? Like the contracting process is really something that all the entire company has to buy into um, because it affects things like revenue or how the sales team functions or how marketing can use logos. So there's a lot of information there. Um, and streamlining that process, pardon the pun again, um, is probably is is I think a real advantage and time saver for for organizations. Um, you know, Jordan, I I I think one of the things that Kevin hit on and Kathy hit on is uh, Kevin hit on some use cases that are really drafting focused, like how to create content, make citations correctly and whatnot. Kathy's talking about the negotiation process. When you think about Clear Law and the AI. Um, are there things, other opportunities you think um, for AI to help in-house teams, uh, particularly maybe on the post-execution side? Yeah. And, and before we get into that, I just want to reiterate uh, something that both Kevin and, and Kathy hit on, which is, you know, Kevin, you you want to play with this stuff. You want to get it going. And I know you think, and I agree with you, that using these tools will kind of up your game as an attorney. You'll be knowledgeable. Um but with that said, I, I don't want anyone to freak out on the call right now. Like, oh God, now I've got to become a prompt expert. I got to take this course. Maybe at some point, you know, it'll be part of continuing legal education and, and you'll enjoy that. Um, but really that usability and the intuitiveness that Kathy mentioned, that's really important. And I think uh, you don't need to do that. We're building tools to so that you don't even know you're interacting with with AI. Hopefully that's that's the goal, right? Is your example, Kevin, on on the Slack uh, interface you had, the person who's asking that question doesn't know that it was sent to an LLM and got an answer and then reviewed by an attorney. They just, at the end of the day, got their answer, um, whether it was it was okay or they had to change some things. So that's that's really important, and I think that's going to continue now, Brendan, to your next question on um, additional use cases. We, we we have the human in the loop, and maybe I should also add on to that. Um, when Kathy was talking about, you know, the, the AI is parsing the document and then, and then flagging certain things, if they deviate from the playbook, like we're presenting that to the human user. So there is that human in the loop, the check, um, moving forward, there will be more opportunities for post-execution where maybe it's not looked at again. Uh, there, there's a human in the loop before, but once that document is, is signed and executed, let's get the data out. So we're, I'm talking about mass data extraction. And that's really big for, for us and our, our area of focus because we think there's so much data that's ignored in contracts that could be disseminated and used throughout the rest of the organization. We've talked about finance. You know, It's not just about payment terms, but when can you raise prices again? What's the cap? Who do you have to notify? When do you have to notify them by in order to raise prices? So, so that's something that affects revenue, right? Um, you mentioned marketing and using customer logos, but essentially everything in that contract has a purpose to somebody in the organization. A lot of them are for the legal folks and to calculate risk or think about risk, contract risk. But I think the majority are probably impacting other people in the organization, um, CFOs and COOs and head of sales. Um, and so being able to get this, this data out and usable um, and, and to do that, you have to be very consistent um, for it to talk with third-party applications, whether it's NetSuite or Salesforce, something like that. Um, and that's one of the areas that we're really focused on is combining what we're doing in artificial intelligence, supervised machine learning, and generative AI, um, and combining that with a knowledge graph that we have of legal language so that you can adjudicate between results. Maybe you ask the same question to four different tools and you can get back, you know, you get back two answers. Well, how do you decide which one is right? 
across those four. So that's what we're really interested in, in solving for so that you as a in-house legal team feel comfortable um, actually disseminating that contract data throughout the org. The other, the other area, which is closely tied at, at the end of the day, the contracts contain obligations um, or we say forbiddances, but prohibitions on what you can't, you can't do uh, right. Or you're, you're in breach of the contract. So when we talk about getting this data out, once it's in a usable format, you can automate a lot of the obligations management tracking or, or the obligations tracking and know whether you're in compliance or not. And the goal would be to make that more automated, much more automated than it is now. Excellent. So I think I think there's really a theme there for democratizing that data to a lot of teams. But if you have a comprehensive look at that data, you can do that. Like you need a lot of data to be able to to be able to disseminate that to a variety of teams. I think especially in something like obligation management, it goes to something that Kevin, I know I've, I've spoken to you about, which is that you really have a focus in compliance and risk management. How are you leveraging AI to kind of support your tasks in that area? Yeah, I think um, back to kind of the, what you're using it for and, and some of the uses that you, you guys are enabling with Clearview. I mean, there's you contract and that's a moment in time, but most of us who are in-house attorneys live with those contracts then. And we get, I, for better or worse, um, you know, we read and write for a living. And I think we're seen by the rest of the organization, even though they could pull up a contract and read it, it sometimes is written in ways that it's harder for them to understand or to interpret. And so we often get asked, um, what does it say about finance? What does it say about marketing? And um, and we get asked to interpret that. But then there's the nuance part of like, it says that we can't do X, but what happens if we do it anyway? And, and we get asked a lot of those questions. So the first part is, what does the contract say? Which, you know, um, you guys help a lot with like being able to pull that information probably really readily out of the system and understand that and know exactly the clause. But then we get asked to interpret like, can we breach? What happens if we breach? How much will it cost? Um, as I'm doing my product counseling or as a general counsel, you know, you're synthesizing multiple things. You're synthesizing what are all the contracts that we have across organizations say, what are all the regulations say and the laws, and then what are our company policies or our company practices? You synthesize that to deliver an answer and having, a, you know, having more and more of these pieces where an AI can deliver you a, a quick summary and help you move along can help you deliver advice that's consistent across your teams, um, consistent across the company. And I think that's good for compliance um, to have some consistency with your responses and your uh, results that you provide to the to the business. Um, but yeah, I, I I see the integration of these two things as a as a step forward in kind of reaching the nirvana for an in-house counsel of being able to ask an AI or have the business team ask the AI a question and have an answer generated that's close to what a junior attorney might provide um, so that I can then um, take a look at it, enhance it if I need to, and save a lot of time by by using the AI and the overall system like Streamline to, to deliver that. I'd love to maybe expand on that from a, a question we've got in the chat from from a Dylan Payne here that asks, is the ultimate failure is that the AI cannot read between the lines? Intuition is part of a lawyer's skill set to a degree. I think, Kathy, I think one of the things we've been talking about is continuing to have that human in the loop experience. So I'd love for you maybe to address that question a little bit and talk about how streamlined views kind of leveraging AI and its technology, but also keeping that human in the loop. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think with, you know, just the advent of, of so many technological advances, it's going to lead um, lawyers to to really lean into that even more, right? Like that's really the differentiated value that we provide um, is the humanity that we bring <laughs> to the work as well, right? And, and, and our intuition and our ability to kind of to Kevin's point, know when we can actually break the rules um, and, and go outside the lines and what the consequences are. And, and actually also package that in a way that our business clients can understand, right? That's a huge thing that I think, you know, AI would, would really struggle with. So um, I feel like, you know, what we need to do though is lean on the technology 
to handle all of the really low value and repetitive stuff that we get hit with as in-house counsel every single day. I can't tell you how many times I've had to answer the same question, you know, in a given like day or week, like, did we sign the NDA with this party? Or, you know, what does, what does like the, what are the renewal terms in that contract? It's like, then I have to pull it up, find out where it is and find the language. I mean, all of that stuff can truly get replaced, right? Using, using AI, um, anything that requires us to like, look at large volumes of data, create patterns, identify what that is. That could be easily like hours and hours of and a junior attorney's time. Um, let's cut down on all of that. So then we can actually have the right mental capacity and time to spend on, you know, the sophisticated legal analysis, right? Crafting a thoughtful response to the leadership of a company to tell them, hey, this product launch actually introduces really significant risks, um, or maybe this global expansion, you know, often business teams want to charge ahead, right, with their ideas, but we need to be very delicate in how we kind of counterbalance that. Um, so that's really where we should be spending our time. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I think that's a really thoughtful answer. Um, you know, adoption, I think, is a theme that's that's going on. we got another question in the chat here. Um, it's from anonymous and uh, attendee. Uh, I work on a legal team that's pretty risk adverse to adopting new technologies. Any tips to best practices for encouraging adoption of new tech, especially AI? Kevin, I'd love to have your thoughts about that. Like you, I know you're a guy who really embraces technology, but I am sure you have attorneys on your team who are like, I don't trust that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to learn a new skill set. Um, or they're very cautious or very risk adverse as this question asks. How do you work with your team to both overcome that, but also I think understand the limitations of where the technology is, like not asking it to do too much, just yeah. do the right amount. Yeah, just, I think just as when I went from engineering to law school and realized that a lot of the skills that I learned as an engineer and the thought process was very, very similar, if then else. I mean, like I program computers, like we think, that way as attorneys, there was a reason why logic and analytic games were on the LSAT. Um, they really are what we do day to day. So I don't think it's that much of a leap. And I think uh, maybe attorneys who don't have the engineering background maybe have a little bit of fear of it, but I think you actually um, think a lot like engineers, think a lot like computer scientists um, could actually do a lot of the things that I've done um, cause I've forgotten my programming skills by long, long ago. I don't program in Python or Ruby and rails or anything like that anymore. Um, you know, so, um, I think it's actually easier than you think. And I think, I don't know, I'm a little bit of a rule breaker. Like if I were in that environment, I'd probably have my own chat GPT subscription and be using it behind the scenes to accept, you know, to, to do that first pass on, on a draft of something. And of course, use my own eyes and review it, but, you know, increase your own productivity. Um, you may not be able to use it like an embedded in a Slack channel, like, you know, like I can as a GC or as a senior leader in legal and just make an executive decision to do that. Um, but you can use it behind the scenes and at least become familiar with it. Um, you can take a prompting class. They're, they're not that expensive or take Josh's Brainiacs, you know, course, it's 199 or something like that. I think they're both well worth doing. Um, but, but the creativity is an interesting thing, because when I put together a prompt, when I put together a persona for an assistant, it's really me trying to creatively describe someone. I did a bad Santa for Christmas, so people could send, uh, write me a letter, bad Santa, I've done this, and it would it channeled Billy Bob Thornton. So I described the character from Bad Santa of Billy Bob Thornton. And I, you know, deep inside, he's actually good, you know, but I mean, I just, it was like paragraphs of a character description. And then the output of the GPT was that character and in that voice. So you do the same with an attorney. What's the, uh, a, I mean, you can even describe a risk averse attorney if you want you know, very cautious, wants to double and triple check, um, words things, you know, in precise, you know, ways, you know, that can't be misunderstood. Um, think about that persona and use your creativity to create it. And then your output's going to be closer to what your company is, uh, is being more reserved. 
um, if your company in, uh, is a little more on the edge and wants more risk forward, you know, then describe, you know, someone who is willing to take some risk is sees the nuance and, and all that. And you're going to get a different output out of it. The key is just using your creativity and um, a lot of attorneys have a lot of pent up creativity. There's a reason why a lot of them go off and write novels and um, do other things too. So you've got logic, you've got creativity, use them and, um, and just dive into using the tools. And if you can't use them at work, um, you know, get your subscription and play with it a lot at home. And, and, you know, I, I think you'd be surprised at how much it increases your productivity and can move your career along. I think people yeah. who don't use it are going to be, I think it's really going to be problematic for them from a productivity standpoint. If I could just add on to that too, I, I think the key, if you're on a risk averse team or not wanting to adopt new technologies, start really small. So don't, don't try to do the 18 month, you know, AI CLM implementation. Uh, we're working with a few clients now who, who've literally been trying to implement CLMs for 18 months. Like that's, everyone's heard those stories. No one wants to get themselves into that, but start really small, something that's easy uh, to show value quickly. And so you need to identify the problem. Don't just, hey, we're adopting new technology for the sake of new technology. Identify the problem you're going to uh, solve or that needs solving, a painful one, hopefully, and see if you can do it in, in four to eight weeks and, and track the improvement there. And then once you get, you know, just a small win, even if it is really small, yeah, I, hopefully you've you've built some credibility within the organization to to take bigger uh, tasks on, like bigger projects maybe that could have even larger impact. But it's important to get a win first. Yeah, I, I like that. Start small, let it evolve. Kathy, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is no different than legal teams wanting to adopt any technology, period, right? It's AI is just a type of technology. So you've already done this. If you've brought in any legal tooling into your team, um, there are going to be people who are resistant to anything. So I think it is, you know, just like Jordan said, start, start small is fantastic advice. Um, I think telling stories is very, very powerful as well. Actually showing, you know, the people who are detractors on your team, um, you know, the, the downside of continuing to work the way they work, right? We're only getting more overburdened with volume of work. Um, headcount is getting restricted. Budgets are getting restricted. So if you have to do a larger quantity of work with existing headcount. There's only a, a few levers you can pull. Um, so telling this kind of narrative, bringing them along, and then using champions, because you'll also have people on your team who have bought in, who are like the Kevins, you know, who are kind of trying to get their hands on things. Um, really use them to be your evangelist as well, right? So it's, it's all about um, kind of bringing people along this journey. You know, I'd love to sort of extend that a little bit. There's a question in the comment, another anonymous question about, you know, if we're relying more and more heavily on AI, are we are we hurting the evolution of young junior attorneys who are trying to get reps? And and Jordan, I I know there's a story that you tell about how sort of you came to the inspiration of Clear Law when you were practicing at young guy practicing in-house. We'd love to kind of get your thoughts a little bit on that journey and and how you think it will affect young attorneys going forward. Yeah, I, I think it's a valid fear. I've heard that a lot. Um, I, I Personally, I think using tools, um, AI among them, will actually make for better attorneys more quickly. It allows you to grow faster. And just to give you an example, um, so one of the first evolutions of Clear Law was an, uh, the, it was a tool that allowed um, a new contract to be analyzed against the precedent data set. So historical contracts, legacy contracts that have been executed. And so you could actually see how um, the contract in front of you at, a, at the clause level deviated and how common or uncommon it was. And so one of the things that this lets, you know, even a, a brand new attorney see is, okay, like, I don't even know what's important in an indemnification clause. Like, how is this one different? And what is, what's right look like? Well, if you know that 80% of the time, right looks like X, and this one has also Y and Z, um, it can give you more information. So it's it's a way for young attorneys to get exposure to a lot more information more quickly that's already been done and thought about by the experienced supervised attorneys. So hopefully you're shortcutting the amount of reps that are needed because there's just so much more data available. You can learn faster. 
Um, but I, I do, I, I've heard that a lot and I think it is a valid concern. So Kevin, I'd, I'd love to turn it over to you to see if you have yeah. conflicting thoughts. I think it's a valid concern. I think, you know, for a lot of us who've been in the practice for a long time, we spend the first couple of years maybe doing a lot of document discovery, diligence, where we saw like in a merger or something, the thing that killed the deal, right? Or the thing that like, oh, that deal has warts on it because this particular thing that was done and you learn some things from that. You maybe even, you know, pocket some clauses and some ways of drafting and everything that are very useful from it. Um, I heard though a, a nice analogy to to this. Um, a lot of school, schools right now are struggling with: Do we allow ChatGPT to be used by our students in high school to write essays and all this? And you know there are all the turn it ins and all this to avoid plagiarism. But now you've got even a, a more powerful tool, ChatGPT. What do you do about it? Well, I heard you know teacher compare it to like math. When calculators came out, at first people scientific calculators in particular. Um, some of them were banned, but now they allow them, right? And why do they allow them? Because they make the problems harder. They make them so that they're problems you have to use a scientific calculator and understand graphing and understand the issue more deeply. Um, you know, and the same should be true of writing. Like, let people use it in law school and, and in schools as a first pass, second pass, and then have them describe their editing process. What did you find right about this? What did you find wrong about it? How did you tweak your prompt? How did you arrive at a more honed, better answer for this? So I think it really we do need to have law schools and um, and law firms at the junior level really be pressing to have their junior attorneys use it, but show your work. What are you doing? How are you using it? How are you enhancing and bringing a more sophisticated output because of your use of this? Because it is going to be used um, in-house. If, it, if it's an efficiency improver, we know that like law firms are raising their rates up, up, up. That means you send less work to them because Gosh, you don't, you're not going to send anything except for the most strategic, most important when it's like a thousand to two thousand dollars an hour to get a response from an out, outside counsel. So more and more is going to be in-house. You're going to have to be more efficient and you're going to be using these tools. So it's it's really something we do need to, as a profession push um, in education, both in law schools and in you know junior attorneys to learn how to use these tools to to run up the ladder. Uh, I'll climb up the ladder before it's, you know, pulled up behind. Mm -hmm. I think that's really thoughtful. I, I really appreciate that. We only have a couple of minutes left in the chat. So, um, and there are some great questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to every one. One of the ones I think we can do a quick round robin on maybe to close out is, you know, what is the AI tool that you guys use most often in your day to day? Um, and is there a, a process that you really recommend? Um, so, so Kathy, why don't we start with you and see what's the what's the uh, AI tool that you use most in your day to day? Yeah, I, I think the one that I do turn to, you know, especially and we've talked about this already when I'm kind of stumped for, a, you know, an idea just to get the creative juices going or to even like looking at it as as kind of like an ad advice bot, right, is, is ChatGPT. Um, and I, I'm not running like legal analysis through that thing ever, right? And just, just the other day, I was thinking about creating an internal company policy and, you know, thought about it for a second. And I was like, ah, oh, but what if it leaves out something really, really critical? I'd better actually ask outside counsel for that. Um, but let me ask ChatGPT instead for, you know, um, advice on how to, yeah, I don't even know, like come up with an idea for something. So, yeah. That, that's what I do. Yeah. And Kevin, what's your most commonly used AI tool? Yeah, I probably, you know, lean because I have a subscription to it, ChatGPT, although I tend to go into the assistance and actually once I find um, a thing that I want done, I create an AI assistant and then call it through the APIs. So it's a little more sophisticated than some people. Um, when I'm writing, especially prose, I might switch between that and Claude. They kind of give me different answers. Claude. Um, is a little nicer and ChatGPT can, you know, will come in and say, no, your answer does not, you know, answer all the question or it needs some improvement. Whereas Claude's like, Hey, you did a good job. You got all the points. So I think the personas are slightly different there. And so I switch between 
Um, but I have tried multiple. If you go into AWS Bedrock, you can actually do a side-by-side -side comparison of Llama, Act 21, a few other models and see what output you can get out of them and how it differs. And, and um, you might find one that you like better as a result of that. I haven't played with Adepts, uh, the ones that the company I at quite that much to actually um, see how, um, how they compare. I know that um, they're pretty close to to um, both OpenAI and and Google's Gemini Pro and Pro and Ultra. So I may start using those a little more. But, um, but yeah, I just try them. Try try multiple ones, and you might find one that you like better than the others. And Jordan, I think you're yeah. going last, but I assume your answer is Clear Laws AI. <laughs> well, okay, I was going to go in a little bit different direction. That, that might be true uh, for work, but outside of work, and, and this is to wrap up, you know, what is AI? Like, how is it going to be adopted? Are, are people going to realize they're using AI? Um, mine is Spotify, I think. So, you know, there it's running AI algorithms. You liked this song, you saved this song. Now you'll probably like this one. And lately it's been really helpful because I have two young kids and Previously, my Spotify had no nursery rhymes, children's music on it at all. And I don't know what they all are. I can't, I don't remember all those things. So now I can put in, I search, they they have a few songs that they like, my kids, um, put one in, search for it. And then it just plays for, you know, an hour and it creates, it, these songs are like 90 seconds long. So it's a ton of songs that Spotify finds for me because I search for one um, and auto suggests the playlist of just keep the kids entertained and dancing and occupied. So that's an example of, of, you know, I'm using AI and you don't even really think about it, um, but it's there. I, I think that's a really good example because you, it, we, we talk about all this like new AI stuff. You don't realize how much of it's just been around for, for years now. And it's already part of our daily lives in a lot of ways. So I really appreciate that answer. Um, you know, I think we're, we're a couple minutes past the time. So I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much for attending. There are some additional questions um, that we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, some of the members of this team may reach out to you to see if we can help you guys get answers to some of those questions. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to all of us um, and we will be more than willing to assist you. But again, thank you guys all very much for your time. And I want to thank our panelists who um, I think provided a, quite a bit of thought leadership today. So thank you, the three of you. Thank you. It's great to be part of it.